Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here. Nice to see you. Uh, and uh, we already made contact with the all the colleagues from South Africa. And uh, uh, I would like that during the interval, in the coffee break, that we can also meet at a more personal basis. Uh, but I will start with my presentation just to let you know what's my experiences in the last years. Because we are, I think most of us, we are in the field of education and most of us, we like the technology. How can the technology help us? Uh, first of all, we have to know each other a little bit and as my, I describe my background, I was born in the south of the Netherlands, near Antwerp, near Belgium. And uh, I studied at Utrecht University. I worked for more than 36 years in Twente University in the eastern part of Holland. And I also worked in Amsterdam University. Beyond that, I was lucky to be all over the world, to be invited as a guest speaker or as an associate or a guest professor. And uh, what I would like to do is to give you an impression of my philosophy. And it's not only philosophy, it's my experience. So my presentation is the playing as a metaphor for learning in the 21st century. Now, many of you might associate playing as a primitive way of learning. We put it in the garden. It's part of the Maria Montessori method that children, they have a free agenda and they can explore as they want. If you give them the blocks, they may they might make a city of it, or a car, or an airplane. And that's what we call playing. It's not the same as gaming, you see. There's a big difference between gaming and playing. Playing has a free nature, and gaming has a very focused nature, namely to win. The goal of gaming is to win. The goal of playing is to understand and to enjoy. And I think, that, I think this is an important part also for the more conceptual layers of the learning process, even at the university level, or at the vocational training level. <clears throat> I would like to uh, present to you two journals, International Journal of Web-Based Communities, and the other journal is the International Journal of Continuous Engineering Education and Lifelong Learning, a long time ago. But it means mainly it's about learning technology, the second one. And the first one is the social mechanisms, if we meet and if we join groups of people on the web. When do we call the group community? Well, do we, one, when do we think it's a, it's a social, apprehensive gathering and meeting? That's the topic of the first channel. I have been a uh, chair in many of the conferences like the IADIS and indeed I am a professor of Learning technology by UNESCO. <coughs> this is uh, the group I'm part of, and you can see the major topic is the artifacts like the robotic, uh, like the 3D printing, like the virtual reality, like the media, the hyper media, the social media. And that's the arena I would like to introduce to you. Of course, you know many things about it, but it's my goal to to make you aware. The playing has been chosen not only because of the history. If you go to Amsterdam, like uh, you are going to do, in one of the big uh, museums, like the Rijksmuseum, you can see the pictures by Bruegel. And you can see this is called the playing ground. It's like in the school interval, on the, uh, in the school garden, the children are playing. And you don't Want and you don't need to orchestrate the play. And the message here is that the more we want to control the learning, the more the students will try to escape from the regime. And they will make their own world, their own conventions, their own play, their own rules, so to say. And that's important to know them. And it's even important to say, what can we harvest from the playing mentality? in the classroom, in the official formal learning. Now there is a very straightforward saying by Kenneth Dunn. Kenneth Dunn 
If students don't learn the way we teach them, let's teach them the way they learn. Now, that sounds very nice, very populistic. Uh, but how do we know how students learn? And I can, I can promise you, if you go in that, how students learn, uh, it's a long way to discover it. And you might find, might, might find a lot of difference between the students. Uh, one of the biggest uh, differences that I find, find is that students, some of the students have a weak short-term memory. They learn in a different way. They learn in a more concentric way. They harvest and they build upon what they learned before, the long-term memory. If the students have a good short-term memory, they don't need that. They can just build upon that. The working memory goes automatically, almost automatically, to the long-term memory, especially the sleep. And the, those students, they are, we call them good students, easy-going students, but in the long term, they might have a problem. And the problems of the students in the beginning, who are slow, who are, are concentric or holistic, they might have a very good asset later on to make a problem solve. Uh, the overall question is still, is ICT still a game changer? Is it really something that makes a difference? Uh, I think so. But it's good to know that ICT is not the only one. There's more and we can see it every day. One of the big issues is that the social media might make people in isolation. It might prevent them from having the eye-to-eye -eye contact and the, the voice communication, the face-to-face -face and the voice. Uh, but you can see that it is not new because when the newspaper after the printing press was invented, it has also caused similar problems. And you can say the way of living, like in apartments, like cooling, like urban social style, that's, I think, the dominant factor. And I can talk later with you how it works. Um, you can see the history of social media is it's not only from the last 20 years, it's something longer. You can see in Italy, in the 16th century already, the so-called Lanterna Magica, the magical light source, was a story box. Inside the box was a story, arranged by some people behind it. We know it like puppet game. Yeah. So, what was interesting is not only the story in the box, it's not only what is in the TV, it's not only what is in the internet, it is mostly it's the process of the people gathering and communicating about this problem. If you leave the cinema, you will be disappointed because you get outside and you have to lose the world of the movie. You have to leave it behind. And then the social atmosphere is that you talk about the movie. Without the talk, the movie is just in that and it may disappear very soon. But in the communication, that is the real thing. We have been obsessed. Uh, if you look to the learning theories from the 70s and the 80s, that there was very much attention for the access to the information, availability of good information. And that's already a longer metaphor by Kenneth Wayne, it's the so-called panopticum. The ideal was that in a building you could see everything. That's the case in the prison, where there's one person, one guard in the middle, and he or she can look and see all the 300 guests or prisoners. So the idea of seeing everything from one place, that's what we liked in the beginning. The World Wide Web was a big experience, still it is. But it might disappear, that excitement. And what do we get back from it? What we got back is that we train our students to read very quickly and to read behind the text and behind the pictures. That's why we get more critical students, and that's good because a lot of the information is not reliable, and they need to make their own information, their own construction of the world. I will come back to that. Uh, so we are talking mainly about consuming information. Logging is a ne negative term in the social media, it's called negative, logging. And 
we have certain kinds of participation, there's certain types of interest, that's a small group, but only 10%, and there's a very small, only 1 or 2% is the heavy positive, the people who really make contribution, who think, where are we going to, and that's, we want our students to be here, right? Is it correct? Do you agree? Yeah. Or am I too optimistic? means we have to do something. We cannot simply continue by saying, read your books, memorize them, learn them, learn them by heart, and I will test you. That's, that's good, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Really, to make progress, we need to make students contribute to the, to the field where we teach. An important notion, also given by the social media, also given by the constructivistic learning paradigm is that uh, knowledge is not only in the persons, it's especially between the persons. Knowledge is between rather than within the persons. That means that the real power of the knowledge is when we talk about it, when we make a co-design, when we need to make a decision, when we make opinions, like in journalistic reviews, we share information, but we cross fertilize, we like particularity, we like that you are a specialist in electronics, I am a specialist in chemistry, and we can talk together about new possibilities. So that's called the knowledge is between the people. And then important in education as an just as an advanced organizer, as also will be say. Um, so, of learning is ignored many times. We tell a lot about the culture of the learning. That means the conventions. We normally we agree that for students, when they listen in the lecture, it's not good to eat, it's not good to sleep, or not good to sit like this. We want them to look attentive, open the eyes, keep the eyes and the mind open, and receive. But in respect to what I just told before, constructivistic learning means that we want students to make a contribution. So to make the reconciliation between what they knew before and what they are hearing now. So that means we need students to give some space to work with the information, the elaboration we call it, working with the information. Uh, one thing, the nature of the learning, it's important that normally when students have a nap in or just between the lectures, we don't know how to value that. The short-term sleep, uh, let's say the slow-wave sleep, it's a very small part of the sleep, one or two hours in the night, and in the daytime you can have it in three minutes. That means it's dreaming, and it means the integration of what you just learned. The chemistry goes from the hypochemist to the cortex. And that means if you don't have it, you get into problems. So learning means also some consolidation phase. That's what was happening in the sleep. That's why the nature of the learning, that the mind that has been developed for many millions of years, we need to respect that. We cannot change the chemistry in our brains. That's why persons have a different phase of their development. In the beginning, the, pre for the prefrontal cortex is still weak, so the lack of attention is not so easy to control. Control the mind is what we get when we get all more mature. That's why we need to give some space for the students to do it in their individual way. It's respecting the nature of the learning. What we can see is that if you look to specific areas like healthcare, is in the operation room nowadays. You can see there are several persons uh, to monitor the patient, to assist the surgeon. It's a complex situation that is really to go into the brain, or into the heart, or to go into the liver, endoscopic interventions. But if we go in the human mind to let students learn, it's an even more delicate process. And what do we do? We still have a rather, this is the traditional, the old-fashioned way, and the lecture hall. We still have the lecture halls, like two, three hundred years ago. 
So we are a bit lazy, we are a bit traditionalistic and not very eager to innovate. And I would like and hope that in this meeting, also with the questions you can pose, so that we come to a more active point. What can we expect for the learning in the coming decades? Typically, the teacher has been in this role. The teacher has been talking about the media so that the students understand what the teacher is, a, is explaining. It's a weak way, it's a, it's a problematic way for teachers to teach. This teacher is more heavy. He has more primitive media, like just the light source. And typically, if you see it in the philosophic tradition, the teacher here is getting the ideas from the outer world. He's just molding, he's placing the ideas so that they can be adapted to the development stage of the students. Students like it when the teacher can speak from his or her heart in a very emotional and a very direct way. Not only you reading the text of the powerful, but really talking from his or her mind and the spinal cord, you could say. That's important to realize if we want to proceed. We see also that there is a shift in the need for skills. We have a lot of attention in the past years for technical skills, for human skills like communication, but we know conceptual skills are around the corner. And what are conceptual skills? In the interval, I would like to talk to you at the coffee corner and then ask you what is a concept. And I think there are two main ideas about concept. So most of us, we think a concept is a thing. It's a piece of information or it's an idea. But the real concept is a transition from one idea to another. And that's why I will show you some interesting pictures later where you can really be astounding what is going here. This is a conceptual picture. What is the message here? That in terms of ecology, we should be careful not to waste the basic resources. We need to optimize the footprint, what we leave behind our students. We are borrowing the nature from our children. That's the new conceptualization. And you see that one child in the Western world costs a lot of resources, like the amount of copper, uh, the gold, the coal, the phosphate, aluminium, the lead, or uh, iron ore, etc. It's a complex, it's a very expensive way that we need now as citizens in the, in the urban area. Even more important than ICT, if you ask me, is now the issue of migration. We see that Western, many Western persons, they go around the world. It's not only touristic, it's also because we really want to know what's around in the world. And you see a big, a big proportion of donations before people pass away. If they don't have the children, they may donate their main capital to good uh, missions, somewhere taking care of your children, even uh, protecting animals and plants for them. So there is also a kind of altruistic, kind of exotic awareness now in the people. But also, complementary, of course, we know there's a lot of migration because people don't, are not happy in the area. They escape, they want to go to an area where they think life is more, more happy, more easy going, more comfortable. And that is all part of human mind. It's part of human nature. It's not new because migration has been all, all the ages, from the very early. In terms of learning, what we do, what we call social learning or societal learning, we can see we have active learning as the main paradigm. We want people to go through experiences. Constructivistic, collaborative, authentic, that means that we want students to really learn in a specific context, to stay in their way of thinking, in their developmental phase. And we have intentional learning. That means that every setting, like here, intention is that we have an exciting message 
and we want a discussion, and then we have a problem. That's our intentional content. Um, and there is, of course, the cycle by the column. That means to go through it, we need a more procedural template. And that is concrete experience, like feeling, hunting, smelling, tasting, hearing, seeing. And we have a, 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 a reflective stage. We have an abstract conceptualization. That's the, the pictures I'm going to show you. And active experimentation, and then we have new experience. So it's inevitable that we need to go through these stages before we can understand and value. The big hero, who of you knows Lev Vygotsky? Who's favorite of so, Some years ago, I see some, some uh, reactions. Vygotsky's uh, theory was that the learning is not only an intellectual process, it's mainly a social process. That means without human relationship, without human communication, we cannot learn. The book is not sufficient to learn the building block uh, or the computer is not sufficient to learn. We need the social incentive. And it's important because after the book press, we were so excited that the written word, like in the book, was the final and the good way, the ultimate way, to transmit ideas. Plato, in the old historical time, in the old Greek philosophy, Plato says, don't do it. Don't write your ideas and give it to your audience. No. Talk to the audience. Look to the eyes. And make your voice hear it. Well, once they hear your voice, they can understand you really better at the cost of body language. So, it's important to know. That's the value of teachers. You will never lose your job as a teacher. There will always be children who have not sufficient in using the computers. They want a person to communicate with. So we have a number of new trends. Narrative means the story has been recognized as an important format. Telling stories. Exploration. That's the part of the play. Without discovery, without curiosity, there's no learning. We have construction, we have creativeness and emotion. We know the emotional intelligence uh, rather recently, since five years. Cole is the hero of the world. Where it does is not only an intellectual or logical, it's, it's a social person as well. If you look to the big I.O. Sorry, I'm disturbing the picture. Uh, when you look to this picture, which was part of the early cinema. Uh, you can see there's a direct way of communication, in the sense that the visual is remote. You can see as if you stand before this accident. You see? So it's an emotional thing as well. If you see this car versus this car, what is your preference? What, which car would you prefer? Who would, who would prefer to buy this car? Not so many people. Some of us, they will like it. I would like it for a few hours to explore how the car works. But uh, we want really a, a nice car, a uh, shiny car. But this car has been important to understand how the car works. That's why it's not easy to say what's the best picture. Uh, if you look how to inflate the tires, you can see this is a good way because the surface of contact is on the moon this way of inflating the, the tire. If the pressure is too low, you get only limited contact. If it's too high, also limited contact. So that's a visual way to put the car on the glass floor and see the different tires and see what's the best pressure. So if you ask, if I ask you, what's the best way to visualize the human heart? Who would choose for the first picture? I don't see any reactions. Thank you. Thank you. The second picture. Yeah. Who would like that? Better? Yeah. Or at least you think better. Who would like this picture? For the schools? No one. No one. Who would like this picture? Thank you. I see considerable amount of positive reactions. Why do we 
said this is a better picture? Because it moves. It's very simple. He likes old pictures. He likes movies. But you see, for a certain kind of user or learner, it might be the best picture. For a certain kind of interpretation of the rhythm of the heart. But if you are early, this is an eye opener to get aware of the valves, the, the double system of the heart. So it's not a simple question. It's not like, ah, this is the best picture or this is the best picture. No, it depends on the actual state of knowledge in the learner. And what is the goal? How far would you like to go at the end of the day for this student? It's called in terms of because it's on approximate development. If the distance is too small, there's no use, there's no incentive, no interest. If the distance is too big, you lose the contact. If the student is not aware of, let's say, the, the, the double system and the arteries, then the student will be say, it's nice, but it's no message. So you need a critical distance between what you know and what the teacher is going to bring you. Is this, what's the message of this picture? Who would like to give a shot? What's the meaning? Would you like to give the size of the heart. Thank you. Yes, yes. So your remark is the size. It's a demonstration of how big, how big is the heart. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, new interpretation. Okay. Again. Offering the heart. Yes. So how do we call it? If you offer your heart. Making love. Does the lady, does the lady like that offer? No, not very patient. So you can say in a metaphoric way, it means offering your heart. Say, I love you. But the heart is inside the body. And if we say learning by heart, what do we mean by that? What is it? Yes, memorizing. Yeah. So that you can say it without the text. Yes. But in the past it had different meaning. Because the heart was seen as the mind, the soul. Yeah. Before we discovered that the brains are important. So now we would say learning by mind, but we don't say it. We still call it learning by heart. It's old, it's already four, 400 years old, let's say. So uh, now I go to this picture and I want you to discuss with your neighbor what's the meaning of this picture. You get two minutes to talk about it. And I would like to, to talk with your neighbor about what's the meaning of the picture.
So that's a positive. It's an optimistic view. <laughs> <cure. laughs> Thank you. We have a lot of other uh, issues. Please, ladies. Well, my focus is on that man over there that has something like bad skins. He appears that like he's doing some manual labor. And with that manual labor, he cannot go too far compared to this other man that is using some kind of implement. And so there is more room for expansion here than the other guy over there who is planning to use some kind of manual. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's the growth of urbanization. The growth of urbanization. Organization? Urbanization. Urbanization. Yes, thank you. So, uh, it will be sick. Yeah? That's what you want. Uh, is there more? Please. Is this uh, Dubai? Uh, <laughs> 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 thank you. Look, uh, I don't think... Uh, my association was... Uh, first of all, it's an artificial... Yeah. It's a very, but I think it's not a direct reference to any city. But it might be in Asia, but uh, when I see the man, I, I have to doubt. Uh, so it could be Western, Eastern, Southern, doesn't matter. But anyway, there is a message, but there are many messages. And we are not sure at this moment. Yes. Uh, I think it is more than imperialism. <laughs> Thank you. That's a critique. Uh, <laughs> Terrible colonists made all cities, but what are they doing here? You see. So it's a skeptic. Thank you for your reaction. Are there more strong reactions you would like to say? I think it's uh, as that's the third picture of the, the, the moving the blocks and putting the instruction uh, building So you are a bit hesitating. Will this be the city? Will it be a human human society after planting the goods? That's what you want to say. Or is it nature? There will, uh, there will be uh, no plants in this area. It will uh, be just planting. So people have to cut the trees and then plant buildings for concrete, similar to the direction <laughs> replaced by concrete. Okay, so more. For me, I see planning in place here. Um, the buildings are not put together, they are being spaced. So that is to tell you that there is a proper planning in place here. And what is beneath the building on the wheelbarrow, it's a sort of foundation to tell you that the buildings stand very well on this particular floor. Thank you very much. Thanks for all your, sorry, for all your reactions. Uh, what I want to say is that there are so many potential messages here, and uh, what we hope is that it's a start of thinking for students. So this kind of pictures is what I give them, but also I ask them to display their learning in terms of a picture. It can be a photograph, what they see in the commercials like this, it can also be a drawing, a sketch, or a concept map. So, the reality, what we call reality, is a very multifaceted process, kaleidoscopic process. And understanding a process like urbanization or ecology is a very elaborate process. It's not only one view that we would like to accompany. We want students to take different views and then combine the knowledge. Uh, inherently, I think there is a critique here because building is, is displayed as a plant and also the person is walking away because maybe the, the building has grown and will now go to the, to the real city. That's also a kind of interpretation, but it depends how far we see, how far are we willing to give up our prior ideas. If we say the city should be a society, then it's a critique. If we say the cities need to be built because we can, we, we can control, we, we can plan and design, that's a more positive thing. But let's see. What is the meaning of this picture? I can show. I can tell you. It was placed on a Dutch newspaper about 20 years ago. And uh, without the knowledge, it's not so easy. But what kind of term would you say is it? Does it look safely? Not at all to be in this train. Does it look very wise? Is there a message here? 
what's the message, what will be the critique. Now, uh, it's good to think about it, but the, the only way to reconstruct is go back in the history, in the newspapers, or whatever. The critique was that the discussion was, do we need a second track for the fast train? So this is the normal train, and then we introduce the fast trains like the TGV or the Shinkan set in Japan. And the message was, yeah, Holland is a small country. We have here the green heart of Holland between Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Utrecht. Don't spoil it with the second track. We are spoiling nature, like the first picture. So, at the time, in the parliament, there was this discussion, and there was one journalist who made this drawing, and through this drawing, there was immediately a conceptual view, we have to make a second track. We cannot combine it. It will be dangerous. Uh, and that was happening, in fact. So a conceptual view, like in this picture, can help societies to make a jump and say, that's accepted, we need a second track. Otherwise, we have no options for the future. If we give tools to students like Simon Peppert, who designed the logo, the logo language, and also, of course, the label construction machines, uh, students would make robots or cars. But a typical thing, what happens after two weeks, is that one of the students, and these students were in jail, this experiment was students who were not allowed to, to go away number of months because they, do, they did bad things. And what happened, this kind of construction, not only this, but they went further in order to, to escape. This is a machine to climb the wall. So you can say, you can see, students are not only making that elaboration because it's intellectual or because it's nice. No, they want to make a contribution to, to their future. And that's what we have to keep in mind. Uh, sorry, this picture is a bit spoiled, but the essence is that what we read and what we hear and what we see, there's a limited amount of memory. What we see and hear, we remember more. What we discuss is even more. And what we experience is even more. And what is the highest degree of memory? When do you never forget it? Hearing. Sorry? Hearing. Hearing. Yes, healing is very important, but also teaching. Once you're taught a topic, you can never forget it. Yeah? You can remind your first lecture, if you prepare the topic to teach. So, it means that, collaborative learning means that you have to help your colleague or your peer to learn. And that process is quite important, to make clear in words what you want to understand for that person. These are the two learning styles. Uh, I found out with uh, one of my uh, PhD students at, uh, in Beijing, Capital Nong University in China. Uh, Serialistic students, they have a strong, they need a strong sequence. They can remember on page 35, there is a remark, or there was a question. These students, they have a weaker, shorter memory, and they need longer time. Once they understand the topic, once they make all the connections to what they know, they will never forget it. So the long-term memory is much better. In the real long-term, many years, never for, forget about it. These students were students in biology. And we gave them an extra question. Not only mention all the animals that live in a certain condition. No, we asked the students, please design a new living creature. And also tell why it will survive in a certain condition. Many of the students, especially these students, 40-50%, they said, this is not a good question, sorry, it's not a biological question. Because human creatures are not, or living creatures are not designed, they evolve. These students, they do it all the time. So they were very happy to do it. And they made quite new animals and plants by thinking about principles of what is life, what is the essence of life. If I went, when I went to Japan, I was very lucky to work two times on the uh, Japan. This is in Sapporo, the campus. We can see that after all the tests, <coughs> students start to build their own life. 
It's called Fancy Fair. They make their own food, their own music, their own clothes. And they start living from who they are. So we can call it play. It's as if they already start adult life with the children, etc. And it's, it's an interesting process because you could, see, you, you could say that during all the lectures, they had no opportunity to, uh, to express themselves. This is another university near Sapporo. It's called Hakodate. It's the so-called future university. It's not a lecture hall. It's a project, project hall. And students here, they work in teams, as you can see. Why do they work for? For the principals, they have a potential employer who gives them a task. And that means these students, they don't go to this fancy event. They don't need to rebuild their own life. It's already going every day. And you can see these students are very serious students and they have only a limited set of lectures. The professor will go around and they might pull this ticket and say, could you explain about this and this? Of course, he needs to do that. Even the professor might be a project team member or might be linked to the employer. It means that the the goal of the learning is different. It's not only to know what the professor already knows, it's to know more than the professor knows at the moment. They go ahead, they are at very advanced projects. Similar in medical training, this is called, um, it's called mannequin. You, you know mannequin in the, in the fashion show? The, the person walk on the stage, on the, on the catwalk, and so this is mannequin because it allows you to go in the human body, in the virtual human body. And before students, they go in the operation and they practice many things. And what you can see, the same mannequin here for removing the, the gel weather. And this is a device for haptic experience. It's like a pen, it's connected to the computer. And if you make a movement in a certain context, you you feel the friction. It means that you touch as if you really go in the human body to palpate the stock inferences. So what we did is we asked an expert, a doctor, Bob Gilkerken, who's doing it every day. This. So he was calibrated to say, if I'm here in the human body, near the stomach, it feels like this. This is the, the resistance in the movement. So he teaches Device, how to give the feedback. Now, interesting is when students start working with it, after a few hours, they are even more accurate than the professor who made it, the expert. So you can see that the world of the game gets very familiar to the students, and as soon as the students have so called higher performance on the game, they should stop the game, they should go next phase start experiencing in the real patient because otherwise it's an artificial thing. So the same as some flight simulators. You might master the flight simulator, but the real pilot might be poor in the game. And then the game is not good, of course. You need to go to the real plane in order to prove that you understand it. In order to make and to design such learning environments, this is the classical way. Analyze it, design develop an implement called Aki. Uh, and this is the reality. Making learning environments is a process of trial and error. There are no hard rules how to make learning better. You have to do it by, int by intuition. And this is a kind of view on what is the design. And what I designed as a design method is existential analysis. Who or do you want to be? that's important for students. It's the conceptual representation, we will go to that. Metaphoric rendering that has to do with the pictures of the organization. It means you need to find a picture that is a summary of your view, structural designs, navigational maps, and 3D collaborative concepts. Okay. It's a bit, a bit complex words, but the, the message is that you have to go through the stages to make your system a bit more adventurous. Try to use it. 
try to use 3D printing, try to use speech recognition. They are all part of the future of our students. Uh, the, the tragedy of learning design tools is that for the production, we have many tools. For the conceptual design, the initial design, we have very few tools, but the impact is huge. So we would like to have tools that support the design process in the early beginning, and not only here. This is a picture of our curriculum. So it's a bit hard to the microphone. So when we talk about the domain, we might very quickly see that we have too many topics in, in, in the curriculum. <coughs> we have many languages, we have mathematics, all the cultural topics. So the question is, what is wrong with the current cur curriculum? Well, they have so much information. But for students, it looks like eating too much. So you need to reduce, to prune the curriculum and what to get in place instead of that. It is the student adventure, the curiosity to find out his or her own interest. Uh, a good metaphor was a good metaphor. Uh, you had a lot of flexibility and it was too with the hypermedia and the multimedia. Uh, and finally, we end up with very complex skills. If you want to visualize the information on the web in a certain domain, it's very complex. This is a scheme, schematic drawing about if you buy or sell a house to this. So it means we need conceptual representations that are more easy, that are more epistemic. That means it should be about episodes and it, it should be more positive. How to do that? This is one of the early concept drawings before you study. You have to make a conceptual scheme, what you know already. There's a graph representation where we can say the centrality of the nodes depends on the number of relations. And this is a tool to show the size of the nodes depending on the uh, structural relations. We have the fish eye browsing. What Google does is a car with a big ball on the roof in order to visualize Amsterdam City in a few minutes. We have the maps like Finland will draw the map like this. And the big challenge was in the early stage of the underground map. The longer underground was like this map. The times could be seen and it was hard to interpret where to go. John Beck made a big step in the 30s and uh, made this map. This map is in fact not a map, it's a schematic drawing. It reflects a little bit of the topology, but it's not correct. Why not? Because the center has been magnified so you can easily see all the details. But if you say, ah, this looks quite close to the green part to Piccadilly Circus, it might be a uh, difficult thing. It might be uh, it's a bit much longer than you think. This is a concept of drawing of Europe, it's about the gateways. In general, we can say, say that uh, the, this is the traditional way of marketing. So we have conquering the market, colonizing the market, and go to the consumer. This is the new way. It is the effect, the bottom up way where the consumers become the designers. If you buy a new scanner or a printer or a camera, you will find out that you are one of the people, the persons in the laboratory. And you will pack it the look, or can it the look, how you use it, and they might make a new version. This is my summary. The learning is an important process. The, le the learning and the playing goes very well together. The learning and the working will go very much together, as we saw in Hakodaten. But the playing and the work is really broken. So I want you to think about what is the synergy between playing and working. Is it is it contradiction? Or is it is there some synergy to the need to work? My outcome is that we need it. The good working of the future needs a component of playing. And that's 
what I would like to, to think about, and you have some options to bring questions. If you have questions or remarks, please feel welcome and you get a microphone. Thanks for your attention.